me do it here. Let's turn my camera off for you guys here. So, yeah. Thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Brian Hobbs. I'm the uh, CEO of Proven. And I myself, as well as Demetrius Williams, who's on here as well, my CTO of Proven, uh, we are, as you know, reactivating the Hyperledger uh, meetup here in Atlanta. Um, I think the last time this group met was 2017. Um, <laughs> so this is going to be interesting uh, for us to get this restarted. Uh, we'd ask you guys to help as much as you can um, with this group because, again, it's 688 people in this group. But uh, as you can see tonight, we're very – we don't have as many people. Um, so since 2017, we're not sure where everybody is, but we want to try to get them all back. Um, but we want to make this um, experience fun, um, make it in informational, and definitely help people out who want to learn more about Hyperledger. Um, so today, um, we do have Auburn University. We have Matthew Russell from Auburn University, the RFID lab. We'll be speaking today um, for our first groups, group, um, group meeting here. Um, and we'll, we'll continue this. And hopefully right now, we'll do this on Thursdays at 6. We started at 6.30 today, but the intent is to be at uh, 6. Um, going forward every every month, we still got to decide on the actual date. But we want you all, as you did with the uh, survey, to give your input. Um, so with that, I'm going to let maybe Demetrius chime in, and then we'll we'll hand it over to Matthew. Okay. Well, I, I'm just going to be real brief because I want to get into the the talk with Matthew, given my opportunity. But as uh, Brian mentioned, uh, I am the CTO of uh, Proven, and uh, we're excited about getting this. Uh, Hyperledger Group started again in Atlanta. Um, and so we would love to get your, your help in making that happen. So please spread the word after this event, let everybody know how good it was and that, uh, you know, get them to so that, or encourage them to uh, visit us next month. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over uh, back to Brian and then Matt. All right. I guess Brian doesn't want to say anything. I can I can go no, ahead and begin. Yeah, we'll we'll let you go ahead, Matt. Uh we're right. doing double duty here. So go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. All righty. Thank you. Cool. So um I'll I'll go ahead and give a background before I before I start presenting. Uh, but my name is Matthew Russell. I've been or I'm a, currently a student at Auburn University. Um, I work for the Auburn University RFID lab. Um, I've worked there for about two and a half years at this point. Um, and what we focus on is primarily identification technologies um, and how we can uh, use those from a technical perspective, but also what the business value is for using those um, in the retail and apparel supply chain. But then we're also looking at other spaces too, um, like food and grocery, as well as aviation. So being the RFID lab, we focus a lot on RFID technology and how we can use that kind of in different use cases. Um, but the projects I've been on, I currently lead the uh, data initiatives at the lab for a lot of our retail and apparel projects. Um, and I've been kind of on various projects throughout the years, but really focusing on that and focusing on really the data capture piece, um, the serialization of items, um, the data quality, and then also the data exchange. And that's the data exchange piece is really where we see um, blockchain and Hyperledger Fabric specifically um, kind of as an opportunity to be used. And we ran a proof of concept um, to actually evaluate that in the supply chain. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Oh, it looks like I need uh, sharing privileges. So I guess Brian, if you're able to give me uh, screen sharing privileges, that'd be awesome. Okay, should have it now. There we go. All right. Um, and I know we have a pretty small group here. So if y'all want to stop me at any point as I'm going through this um, and ask questions or you know, want me to clarify anything, then definitely feel free. Um, it's, it's a relatively short presentation. So it's not like I'm, I'm uh, really trying to get through all of it. Um, but all right, we'll go ahead and jump on in. So like I said, um, I'm with the Auburn RFID lab and we, we really 
you know, have grown through the years looking at how we can use RFID in the retail and apparel space. And over and over again, we'd work on these projects where we're looking at kind of the entire supply chain. So all the way up to the factory and then down to the store and then all the distribution centers and warehouses and everything in between. And we'll be trying to capture these RFID tags that are being put on clothing items um, because kind of throughout the years and, and a lot of big retailers have pushed it. Um, there's been a lot more demand and, and kind of mandating of putting an RFID tag onto a clothing item um, at source. And they do that for a couple of reasons, but primarily in the store, they will use it for what's called cycle counting. So if I'm, you know, in a retail store, like, you know, I'll, I'll give Walmart as an example, um, and I'm in the apparel section, if I want to get an idea of what I actually have on hand, then traditionally I would go through and scan the barcode for every item that's in that store. And, and none of us want to do that. No one wants to do that. That takes a long time. And um, they, they only do that a couple times per year, if that, um, because it really is a pretty involved process. And so RFID, what that does is allows them to not only um, assign a unique identity, but also read those tags in a much easier fashion. So instead of establishing line of sight with every item, then they can you know, put out a radio signal with either a handheld device or a fixed infrastructure or something like that. Um, and then read all those hundreds of tags in a matter of seconds rather than just a few tags. So then they can get a better idea of specifically what they have on hand um, more often and then drive up their inventory accuracy numbers. So that's kind of how RFID began in the apparel space. Um, but as we began looking farther upstream, we realized, well, you know, we're, we're tagging these items at the factory and they're going all the way through the supply chain down to the store to be used but why can't we capture this data at every point along the way in the supply chain and then leverage that? Um, but we ran into a problem of, well, there's not really a great way to share this data or exchange this data in, in sort of a democratic way. Um, when we begin looking at you know, complex trade networks, you can't just say, okay, we're gonna use this one platform or have this one solution provider. Um, so we needed something that's, that's sort of distributed and easier for, um, individuals to, to tap into. So all that goes to say that we put together um, a working group to kind of work through some of these problems and then jumped into an actual proof of concept uh, for what that would look like. And you can see here, we had Nike, Macy's, Kohl's, Herman K and PVH as the partners that were uh, on that project. And we wrapped that up in, the, in uh, December of last year. And then now we've moved into the uh, the pilot piece, which is what we're working on and I'll get to some of the details on that later. Um, so kind of like I was saying earlier, what we're traditionally looking at in the supply chain um, is very siloed. Um, so this, this ASN here at the top, that represents the traditional flow of data in the supply chain generally. Um, and that's really point to point. So a manufacturer would say to a supplier, hey, you know, here's the advanced shipping notice for what I'm supposed to be sending you. And then the supplier is pretty much blind until the products actually show up. And then even then it's difficult for them to, to validate and, and double check everything to make sure it matches up. So they really just trust the manufacturer in what they say they're sending. And the same goes from a supplier to a retailer or even a retailer to their own retail store. Um, so we shifted from, that's, that's called G10 data. That's a global trade identification number. There's a lot of uh, acronyms on the screen. So, you know, bear with me here. But um, all that is is just like a barcode. Again, that's a quantity level basis. So the manufacturer would say, hey, I'm sending you five white t-shirts. And that's the only, you know, that's as granular as that data gets. So like I said, we've kind of shifted towards the RFID data, which is serialized. So then, okay, you know, we can distinguish each item. It, it has a, an identity. Uh, every product, I guess. But even if we're capturing that data for each of these unique items at every point, we're still not sharing it. It's being siloed, uh, which you can see here on the bottom of the screen. So we're not leveraging it to, to really communicate what's going back and forth. So when we begin to look at the blockchain and how we can implement that, this is kind of the general idea of rather than having the serialized data be siloed at each point, we, we create something that's no longer unidirectional, 
but allows greater visibility for the supply chain partners. Um, so they upload data to the blockchain network and a manufacturer can say, hey, here's the individual items that I'm sending you, uh, the supplier, and the supplier can see that before they even receive them. Um, and, and it is so much easier for a supplier or a retailer or anyone to validate and say, okay, let me make sure I got what I received when they have a known ledger of what they're already expecting um, because then they're not operating blind. So that's the big idea. And there's a couple of different business values or reasons that uh, you know individuals in the supply chain might wanna do this. And that is these numbers here. Um, so this is from the uh, retail and apparel, and I think it includes grocery as well. Um, but the supply chains, and we're looking at about $100 billion of counterfeiting cost each year. And, um, you know, this is pretty ambiguous. A lot of this is also unknown. Uh, claims is estimated to be around $35 billion and then shrink at about $50 billion yearly. So claims is when a supplier would send a retailer or any manufacturer supplier, any two partners would have a disagreement on what's being sent. You know, so a retailer would say, hey, you know, I was supposed to receive 10, but I only actually received nine items. Um, let me let me issue a claim for that. Um, and then shrink is really lost or unaccounted for inventory. And that could be due to theft or administrative errors. Um, I think the idea is that we really have no idea. Um, otherwise it would be classified differently. And so these are huge problems in our supply chain and we don't have great visibility into you know, how we can resolve these or what's actually going on. Um, and that would definitely ease some of the pains. And that's what we believe and what uh, we feel blockchain can help us work towards. So again, these are the partners that uh, helped or, or uh, contributed data to the proof of concept. We split them up into three different data streams or three different channels, my bad. Um, so Hyperledger Fabric offers the channel function, which allows us to um, kind of create a partitioned off space where Macy's, for example, wouldn't be able to see Cole's data. So Nike was vertical, um, going from encoding data at the manufacturing level all the way down to the store. Um, Herman K and Macy's were a partner pair, and then PVH and Kohl's were also a partner pair. And the primary focus of this is really looking at that handoff point between the two partners, so a, a brand and a wholesale retailer because that's what we're most concerned with. That's where those claims are going to arise and those disagreements come up. You know, when, when Herman K, for example, um, would send something to Macy's and then Macy says, hey, wait, you, know, you didn't send me what I was asking for. And then they just go back and forth on email trying to figure that out. Um, so that's kind of what we were looking for and, you know, how we could ease those, uh, those pains with blockchain. So we broke it down into three different steps. The first being to identify the systems and the stakeholders. So you know, looking at the supply chains of each of the partners, looking at who controls that data, um, who, you know, you know, what points can we even get data? Where are you capturing data in the supply chain? Um, and what sort of system, systems do you have and how can we uh, gain access to that? And once we identify those data streams of, you know, where are you reading the RFID tags or the case codes um, and different things like that, we really had to work to standardize them. And, and that, that's a huge part of this. And that's what we spent a lot of the time on was, you know, we, we have to make sure we're speaking the same language if we're going to have a, a common network among us. Um, and so we use EPCIS and that's an event based standard that's been defined by GS1. Um, and that sort of captures the context of what's happening uh, to a product in the supply chain. And um, that was, was hugely important. And that's what we feel uh, is going to be the future kind of language of business, at least in the supply chain um, for product uh, based events. And then the last step was to actually integrate this data. So we've identified where the data is coming from, how to get it, we standardized it, and then, then we actually integrate it into a common network. Um, and that's a hyperledger fabric based uh, solution that we, we put together. So again, this is a uh, focusing on EPCIS here. It answers the questions, what, when, where, and why. So what item is going from point to point at what time, uh, what's the location of that and then why, what's going on? Is this item being shipped or is it being received? Um, there's a whole kind of vocabulary that GS1 has defined 
Um, and I know that standards are usually boring, but they're pretty necessary. Um, so that's definitely something that's, that's really important when we begin to kind of move towards a common platform like this. And then finally, we integrated it into the blockchain. So um, this is kind of the exciting part, the, the new part. Um, and we worked with the IBM blockchain platform. Um, it's relatively easy to use. We didn't have to um, code a lot of the, the parameters of the network, um, but we did have to put together uh, client applications and then a front facing web application to actually um, both write and read um, the data that was going through. So each partner that was contributing data to the project could go in and upload their own data, but then also read the data that's in their specific channel. Um, so as soon as their partner that they're <clears throat> working with or uploading data with put something in, then they could say, hey, you know, I can make sure that the items that I sent have actually been received um, and can see the history or, or see the story for every single product um, that they're sending data through for. And that's what we, we really want to get to is a common place where uh, a supply chain stakeholder can go in and really see the entire story of each of their products um, that are going through the supply chain because right now they don't have great visibility into that. And there's a lot of data here. I can send out this um, deck afterwards to everyone that was on the call, or not a lot of data, but a lot of information um, because I think it might be helpful if you've got more time. And then finally, ultimately we had about 223,000 RFID tagged items that were uh, accounted for from source to store. And that's, <clears throat> that's kind of at various points. Not all of them were all the way from manufacturing to the retail store, um, but it was 223,000 items that we saw um, in our blockchain. So key takeaways. Um, we were able to see that, you know, blockchain actually does work. We can use it to exchange data, but the reality is that the transaction speeds are pretty low. Uh, I think what we were able to get to was like 25 to 30 transactions per second, which, um, you know, I know now with, with Fabric, there's been a lot of testing for higher transaction speeds and um, we obviously are a group of students from a university, um, but we did work with the IBM team and, and some other individuals on this. Um, and compared to traditional systems, it, it is by default um, not as efficient. <clears throat> so I think it does need to be proven as scalable before we begin actually using it to exchange data. Um, because that's what we were doing was taking data itself and exchanging that rather than using it as like a validation of some sorts and only storing hashes um, or something like that. And that's what I know a lot, a lot of other projects are doing. Um, and so that'll probably be the route that we go um, in the future, but that's something that we're still kind of exploring. Um, but then beyond that, EPCIS is key or really any standardization is key. Um, I said it earlier, but I'll say it again, that a common platform requires a common language so you know, regardless of, of what sort of network you have for those data inputs, you wanna make sure that those are um, it's in some sort of standardized format because that makes things a whole lot easier. Um, and then finally, data quality is paramount. And you know, as they say, garbage in, garbage out. Throughout this entire proof of concept that we ran, we didn't focus a whole lot on the quality of the data that was actually going through. Um, some of the, some of the RFID capture systems that were reading items were reading like 70% of the items and they only had them on, you know, a, a small subset of conveyor lines in those distribution centers. Um, so when we, when we really look at, you know, what does this look like in production, we really want to make sure that that data we're sharing on the blockchain is, is accurate. Um, and that really encompasses everything that's, that's going through Otherwise, if we're sharing something that can't be deleted and that we have to append, you know, we don't want to have 70% um, of our, only 70% of our uh, data being correct. Um, and so that's what kind of going out of, and I've got the launch the chip pilot is kind of what's next. Going into the chip pilot, we're really focusing on that data quality piece because that, that's really important to, to get the business value out of an exchange mechanism like blockchain. Um, and you can see here on the right side of the screen, again, we want to look at the scalability and the performance of blockchain. Um, I think we're still a little bit early on um, for, for some of the demands that we're seeing in the supply chain. 
space. Um, although there definitely are use cases that um, the blockchain could be applicable for. And then also look at vendor neutral networks and, and multi-cloud deployments. Um, because when, you know, when we're in a, a space where there's a lot of players and someone has to be controlling that network um, and, and that's going to have to be a neutral sort of entity um, because you know, no one, no one's going to participate if you say, Hey, you know, you have to give all your data over or you have to control or be controlled by this one organization um, that they may not trust. And that's a really big inhibitor. Um, and something that a lot of people have brought up that they're concerned about. So, you know, making sure that we really do have a neutral environment um, that can support different cloud systems or different cloud deployments. Um, that was a huge uh, kind of concern or, or I guess, key point from a lot of our uh, participants in the project and in the work group that we've had. Um, and then next, next for us is also to look at the pilot, um, which is really focusing on, you know, now we've, we've identified what it looks like to exchange data, but if we were to exchange that, what are the business implications of it? Um, and, and how can we reduce those things like claims and shrink? Um, and what are some of the benefits we see from capturing serialized data and communicating that in the supply chain. Um, and so that's really that's what we're focusing on now, but we found that we, we really need to get that quality data, you know, make sure we're capturing everything effectively um, before we begin focusing on, on how we can actually share it or how we're gonna share it. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we've been the past few months um, on this project at the lab. And that's obviously been slowed down with, with COVID and everything. So um, we're gonna be continuing with that into the next year. Um, and that, that's really adding in that last step here of you know, identifying, standardizing and integrating, but actually analyzing. And that's the end goal is you know, if we're using blockchain, taking things like smart contracts to leverage the data that's on that chain uh, and actually analyze it to you know, derive a business value for what does this mean? How does this help us? Um, because that's what's going to get a lot of the supply chain stakeholders on board. You know, that's all they're looking for is, hey, how much money is this going to save me? Um, or how can this make my life easier? And so that's the part that we're, we're really looking into and focusing on uh, now. And here's some more information about that smart contract piece um, and how that would actually work. This is pretty complex, um, but essentially, you know, taking the data on the chain and verifying it with, you know, what's supposed to be sent versus what's actually sent um, and then creating an alert for if those uh, don't match up. But again, I can, I can send this out if, if you would be interested to kind of take a closer look at it. Um, so that's, that's all I've got. I, I know I kind of rushed through that. So if anyone has any questions um, or if I didn't clarify anything or you want me to go back, uh, feel free to speak up. All right, everyone, uh, please don't be shy. Uh, definitely want this to be an interactive, interactive uh, experience. And thank you, Matt, Matt for, uh, for this great presentation. So hopefully we'll get a lot of questions here. I have a question. Yep. Okay. Um, how many different distribution centers were there? Oh, I have to think back. I think we had, I think it was, you know, let, me, let me run back to the slide with the partners and try to recall. Usually I have a slide that, that kind of details the individual ones here. Um, so we would have had one for each of the participants, so five. So, so five, okay. Yep. And um, when, um, I guess, having worked some with IBM in the past, I was curious, um, well, first, I guess, how many nodes did you end up having? Um, that's also a good question. In the actual network itself? Yeah. Or, okay. or more specifically, um, I guess, well, yeah, did, um, I, yeah, I how think many? we had a node for, for each point that was contributing data um, into the chain, <clears throat> which I think would have been, 
I'd have to go back and look. It was either two or three for, for each partner pair. Some of them had one. Um, and then that was, again, split out into those channels. But I, I have to look back. I can get back to you on that. But it was multiple per partner. Okay. So you maybe had as many as 10 to 15? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I was asking that question for a number of reasons. But uh, you said you worked with IBM on this. Did, did it go through all IBM-type nodes? Uh, was it provided from them? Or did you other use other things outside of IBM, other nodes? Yeah, so they were all provided by IBM, and that was through the um, IBM blockchain platform. <clears throat> and then it was supported by the IBM cloud. Um, so that's something that, you know, we kind of got a little bit of pushback on was, well, is that truly blockchain if it's all, you know, kind of centralized in that one space? Um, and so that's what, you know, looking at in the future, how can we bring in other solution providers or service providers in different cloud deployments. Um, I think that was, that was a big concern or not concern, but just kind of something that the, the end users were asking for. Yeah. That's kind of why I was asking the question, you know, cause sometimes they, they say they're giving you nodes, but they put you in one particular farm, if you will. And not that that's necessarily mm -hmm. bad. It's just, that's been our experience. Uh, that would might make, provide some indication of you, you said you had a low number of transactions per second. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, there's a lot of variables there, but that's what I was asking that question yeah. for. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I got yeah. And that's, that's, we didn't. Oh yeah. Go ahead, Daniel. Oh, um, can y'all hear me first off? I just want to be sure you can hear me. Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, my question was pulling back to, uh, talking about your web app and the design of that and stuff mm -hmm. um, was how did you go about designing that and everything? Um, because I mean, most of the blockchain tools like composer from the research I've done there, it was deprecated back in, I think what August uh, 2019, I think it was. Um, so I was wondering, did y'all just build it from the ground up or did IBM help you out with that? Or like, and how'd you kind of link it through with the, your blockchain client and the platform and everything? Yeah, so we, that is something that we did build from kind of the ground up independently. <clears throat> and I wish I, I should have brought some of our technical team members onto here because I know they'd definitely be able to answer some of these in a lot more detail. Um, but we they were able to communicate. So we would upload to the web app <clears throat> and that would go through to the client and we kind of tailor each client to feed into uh, that, the blockchain itself um, for each different data stream that we were getting. So that would be like each individual node. Um, and then we'd obviously have smart contracts to upload the data in the format that we kind of predefined. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did, we did build the, uh, the web app and the client independently um and i don't i believe they use apis to communicate with each other um but i am not 100 percent sure so if if you want i can get with them and, and get a little more detail yeah no that'd be great um yeah because like my from my experience like they had a great tool there i don't know if you ever uh played around with hyperledger uh, composer but it was a fantastic tool I mean, you could build a whole blockchain application. I mean, as bare bones as it was, I mean, you could build it in 45 minutes mm -hmm. and then like they just got rid of it. And it kind of really from a uh, front end perspective of developing a web app, like there's nothing that has come out that I am aware of. Uh, there's nothing that's come out since that. I mean, I've heard of many fabric, which is like I've kind of heard they kind of dabble in that, but it's not like a tool that is dedicated to helping you develop a full front end web app essentially to uh, uh, interact with your blockchain uh, platform. So I was just curious. Yeah. Yeah. And ours was, <clears throat> ours was pretty crude. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it was nothing, nothing fancy, but it was essentially, you know, click here to upload a file and then click here to, to get an output um, of the data that's on that, but the um, their IBM's blockchain platform itself is, uh, in a way, it could be kind of the front end 
um, because it allows you to see a lot of the stuff that's actually in the network. Mm. Um, but yeah, we haven't looked really into some of the, the options for that either. So your interface was real basic. Like you said, it was like, like an upload a PDF for an example, and you just click and then upload it. And then, I mean, there was probably a little more to that, obviously, but the gist of it was like, uh, kind of seeing the, um, the transactions, kind of what the history of the, the distributed ledger or what have you, and then like upload a PDF or something to that extent. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, um, they, the partners would use an API to tie into that okay. in some cases <clears throat> to actually kind of automate that process. Um, and that's, that's really what pushed us to, to have that web app. Um, was, you know, that, that makes that process a lot easier, <clears throat> but I know that was, we, we ran into the problem of uh, like querying a lot of different items at once mm -hmm. <clears throat> and ended up having to I think at the time, like mirroring what was on that chain um, and then, you know, letting that function um, because we, we really, honestly, we didn't have the time to, to really build out and explore that, that function uh, as much as we would have liked. Right. Okay, cool. How about a yep. question similar follow-up? Uh, do you know what application development tools they, they used on the front end? I mean, did they use JavaScript uh, or any particular development tools? Um, I am not certain. I, I feel like it was, but I'm going to take note of that and I'll confirm that. And then I can, I can send you an email with the information on it. Um, and, and the database that you, uh, you used, uh, mm -hmm. did you, uh, most of these are non-SQL. Did you guys use a non-SQL? If so, what was it? Um, I know it was non-SQL. Um, I, I don't recall. It, I don't well, recall I think exactly by default, it. Hyperledger or Fabric, yeah. I think uses Level, I think is what it's called. And then you can use Couch, I know as well. Um, yeah, so I it was yeah. it was Couch. DBH, Couch. I okay. that's that's yeah, I what Couch. it was. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, and I apologize. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not the most technical one on our team, so um, you know, I'm not able to answer a lot of these questions. But um, I can, I can get back with my team and, and answer anything that uh, you may have, and get back with you guys. Hey Matthew, I have a uh, question for you. Yep. Uh, not to intimidate. If you don't have the answers, you can always get back to us. <laughs> so um, you you it, it was a nice presentation. So I have just six months of experience and I'm solving something similar problem in supply chain and electronics. So you bring up a very valid point. Uh, the garbage in is something coming garbage out. If the data is a malicious, if it is a counterfeit data or a recycled product data, we are not going anywhere. So. Uh, in this case, uh, I see this like the brand or the retailer submits the data, but let's mm -hmm. say uh, most of the companies they are using, they are outsourcing their manufacturing. Not to bring up any specific country here, but it's a reality. They are outsourcing. So they're outsourcing partners. Sometimes it's their entity in that country, or sometimes it's a totally different country. They just put a label and they just done. Uh, so how, how, how to make sure that if uh, manufacturing entities outsource what the data they are providing is legitimate. So yeah, make sure in this blockchain. Yeah, and that's, <clears throat> that's kind of a difficult question that we've run to because some brands may be using hundreds of different factories to actually produce their items. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's very difficult to manage the data that's coming out of those, especially when it's going onto a chain because you, know, you can say, well, once that data is on the chain, then it's secure and we can trust it, but you have to trust the quality of it before it even goes in in the first place. Um, and so that's, I, that's a difficult question that we're working through right now. Um, and then we're beginning to look at is, you know, how do we, honestly, you need to have some sort of auditing program to, to go through and, and check some of the data that is coming out of these locations that are all over the world 
Um, and, and how do we get to the point where we can actually trust it? Um, and, you know, that kind of probably varies or depends based on what sort of data that you've got coming out um, and going in, working with RFID data. Um, we're working on kind of a, a general process or um, a, a way that you would go about actually auditing the data and verifying that it is, you know, legitimate and, and is accounting for everything. Um, but, you know, needless to say, that's, it is really important to think about, because I think a lot of people harp on the security aspect of blockchain, but, you know, that doesn't help change malicious data before it even goes in or incomplete data before it even goes in. So I got one quick question. It's kind of a crazy question, but I figured I'd ask it anyway. Um, so why did you pick Hyperledger Fabric versus something like Hyperledger Grid? Because Grid was, um, from what I understand, was designed for su supply chain uh, when it was being designed. So I was just curious why Fabric versus like the other uh, platforms or frameworks? Yeah, so I I wasn't even at the lab when, when this, during the kind of inception of this, project um and so that was that was before my time when they actually decided hey we're going to roll with hyperledger fabric um but that was also before grid was was really released um and so i think fabric at the time was kind of the best option for a uh a private and permissioned uh, blockchain i think it just made the most sense to um the our leader that was on the project at the time right i mean i know fabric's probably the most um supported i guess would be the right word um of all the uh frameworks out there um i know sawtooth's picking up some uh, recognition too so mm -hmm. i was just curious yeah yep um there's a lot of you know when you look at the the gs1 standards for barcodes there's a lot of there's about 11 i think primary barcodes that although there's plenty, there's you know ten or eleven that's widely used. How did you get the different uh, people in this group to decide on a common barcode, or did they not have common barcodes and you just you guys just write a application that would interpret the data, you know, basically a filter mechanism? Yeah. So we, it was a mixture of both. I think it was a mixture of having conversations of, you know, we we want to get to a point down the road where we have this standard. Um, and right now, particularly with the serialized data um, and the RFID, you know, everyone's kind of doing their own thing and exploring what that looks like. And so we were able to push some of them to adopt that GS1 standard, the EPCIS. Um, but it was about half and half of some of them chose to adopt it and use it and send that through. But the other half, we just ran it through a, uh, an application. That was part of the web application was it would actually um, convert that data into the proper format before sending it through to the client. Um, and that was, that was another function of why we wanted to have it go through a, a web app in the first place. Um, but ideally, you know, long-term, they would produce it from you know, the output. Yeah, it could be good if it was really standardized, but I figured you probably wrote some kind of a conversion interpreter or something like that. Now, um, I mean, I know it's the university that did that, but who actually paid for the the, the servers and stuff? IBM. I mean, they're not they're not cheap. Usually, after they get you out of the sandbox. I mean, did the university yeah. pay for that, or did they have a contract? Or and then how much do you know how much it may have cost? No, yeah. So that was like a a, a research education grant from IBM. <clears throat> so the university did not have to directly pay for it. Um, I, I don't recall how much it actually costs. Um, I would have to reach out to them and get those numbers. Um, that's something that we didn't really look into, but you know, I've, I've heard from people that some of the prices that you know, IBM or Oracle or some of the other providers, um, some of the prices for these, these services are, are kind of up there um and you know i think that's something that we could have taken into account when looking at how does this compare to you know traditional data storage or communication methods um but yeah i don't we don't have a an exact amount 
That's a really good question, though. I think that's a that's a valid point. Uh, I think. Thank you. I think uh, I haven't looked very recently, but last time I looked, I think for uh, the production size was fifteen hundred a month. But don't hold me to that. And then there was a smaller tier that I think was five hundred a month. I think don't hold me to that. But that's kind of the ballpark, I'd say, about what they're charging you monthly. Got it. Yeah, and that's what, like, kind of moving to the second phase of <clears throat> once we kind of get down the data quality part and begin to look at what is the actual business value here, like how much can we actually reduce these costs is when we were going to really jump into, okay, well, you know, how worth it is this? Because that's the big question that we're getting from all the end users is, you know, yes, this is, this is all right, but how is this going to save me money? And what does this actually cost to do? And how do I do it? Um, and and we don't have great answers for any of those now, um, just because that you know, that hasn't really been explored by anyone yet. All right, any other questions? All right, I guess there's no more. I've got some of these um, noted down so I can get with my um, development team and then um, I think I should be able to get your emails and, and send you kind of a follow up from this. Okay, well, that would be great. Yeah. So we have, somebody made a comment in the, uh, in the chat. Um, or so I can pull that Jorge out. De La o. Um, say multi cloud, maybe not quite sure. I it's think important. he might have said that when I was talking about the grid between grid, grid and fabric, maybe. I think as when I saw that pop up, okay. Ah, uh, I see that now. Okay, any more questions? Any, anyone else? Yeah, I've got one other question. You said you on your on your couch. You're pretty sure they used couch. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you have some students that were really well versed in couch, or um, you know, how did they uh, start using that, or, or did you use somebody outside the university to develop the the database side? Yeah, so that was that was students on our team. <clears throat> I think the one that primarily managed that actually graduated, so um, I'd have to reach back out to him you know, specifically, but. I, I, from my understanding, they had um, pretty significant database management um, experience just through classes and other projects and things like that. Um, but also a lot of, particularly with Fabric, you know, they had to they had to learn just about everything because it was pretty unfamiliar. Um, and so, I don't know exactly how much they they kind of had to learn on the fly, um, but I know that they did have experience um, using kind of database uh, functions like that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, we want to, <clears throat> first of all, I want to like to thank uh, Matt again for the excellent presentation. Um, that he uh, gave tonight um, definitely was a lot, uh, you know, good information here. And I, and I hope uh, we all can take some things back from, um, from what he presented and maybe do some more investigation. He's going to uh, provide the slides uh, to the group. So, um, and then he's got a couple follow-up questions that he's gonna research and get back to you guys on. Um, We'd like to, uh, we're gonna probably send out a survey just to get some feedback from you guys on uh, how we could approve and what you liked and what could we uh, do better uh, with. But we, again, we still encourage you to reach out to others who are interested in this space uh, because we're really trying to grow it again here in Atlanta um, and uh, support the community. So uh, be on the lookout. We're gonna do it again next month, again at six o'clock and not 6.30. <laughs> and uh, you'll get an invite uh, for that. Um, so uh, with that, uh, you guys have a great evening and, and thanks again for attending. And thanks again, Matt, really do appreciate you. Yep.
Thank you, Matt. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.